Uh, uh, E3, um, a Lance Corporal, a Lance Corporal is what we call it. And pretty much you just, not a private, just enough responsibilities that, you know, guys still, you know, you get called to do certain things and stuff because you expect it to be in long enough, so you got just enough to survive and not enough to be yelled at and stuff like that, so. <laughs> <laughs> that in Fallujah, Fallujah, Iraq. Right. Okay. Did you enlist? Yes. yes. There's no draft. Nah. <laughs> Where were you living at the time? I was living in Hartford, at home. Uh, actually, yeah, I was at Central, and then uh, we got the call or whatever, and they said, yeah, you guys are getting ready to go. They kept telling us over the months, you know, it's a 45% chance, then it went to 50 and once we heard the 90% chance, we knew it was going, so it's one of those deals. Um, and you were in the reserves at this time? Mm hmm And then you got... Activated. activated. Yeah. Why did you join the reserves? After 9-11, I kind of thought, you know, I, I was giving blood or whatever, and I was like, well, you know, I, I kind of believe in the cause or whatever. So I was like, let me just go ahead and, and, and go and fight and try to get back at, you know, what happened in 9-11 and stuff like that, so... <laughs> things, I don't know, when you're over there you see things differently, you see, you see a whole lot of um, things you don't really agree with and stuff like that, so you just focus on the guys that you're over there with, just make sure they come home and stuff, That's what, that ends up being your main concern afterwards, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, all my boys are in, the, are in the Army, National Guard, and the Navy, so I was like, well, they still seemed the same way when they came home, so I wanted to do something different. And I always, I always had the, 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 the liking of the Marine Corps and seeing how the commercials was got me. The best uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Do you recall your first days in the service? Yes. Actually, I remember when I was leaving, uh, I remember the recruiter came and got me, and my parents looking in the window getting all tearful. I'm like, you yeah, know, you're not going to get all soft on me and stuff like that. And then once we got down there, it was a whole different world. I just, my whole mindset, and I started asking myself, why did I do this? Because <laughs> we got yelled at and, you know, belittled and stuff, but that's how they do it. They break you down and then they really build you up and stuff like that, so. What are some of the first things you have to do? Mm. When you first get there, you got to, they keep you up for three days automatically. Um, they get you... Make sure your paperwork is good, make sure your health, your condition and stuff is good and um, financially and make sure you don't got any warrants and you're trying to run away from the law and stuff like that. <laughs> and afterwards, they uh, they introduce you to your drill instructors, then it's game one from there. I mean, you already working off of no, three days of being up and then they introduce you to these guys by like the fifth day. So you get two days to kind of relax and then after that. You just, I just remember them jumping up on this thing we call a little foot locker. And they jump up on it and they start yelling at you, move, 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 move. You're like, oh my goodness, are you serious? And then from there on, it's just game one. You're getting yelled at and felt like a kid all over again. <laughs> and this was your boot camp? Boot camp. Joining the reserves? Exactly. Um, what was your drill instructor like? Oh my goodness. Drill instructor? <laughs> He's one of them guys that seemed like, well, they were the type of guys that really seemed like uh, they had no emotions, they didn't care how you felt or what you, what you was going through. Their mindset was transforming you from a civilian to a Marine. So you got yelled at regardless. I remember when I went down there, I was a little heavy set, so um, I'm thinking everything's comfortable. You know, you're free to eat whatever you want and things like that. And I, I got real comfortable. I remember reaching over for a piece of pie and my journalist took the screen. He said, Isabel, you gonna eat that pie? I said, no, sir, no. <laughs> he said, oh, go and eat that pie, and we're going to have something for you later. And after that, I just remember working out for two and a half hours, just me and him one-on-one, -on -one, just sweat, your body shaking because you're so tired and stuff like that. That's the kind of thing they do. But the, your relationship starts to build with them, you know, because when they training you, you can't really talk to them. You got to request, uh, it's like general instructor, this recruit requests permission to use the bathroom. Uh, permission to speak and stuff like that. It's kind of one of those ideas. So they kind of like separate you from themselves to get that superiority. But after a while, they slowly start to go from like the superior figure to teaching to 
adulthood, kind of like parenting and then mentoring at the end. And then afterwards, they were like, well, you did a good job. They talk to you human. You're still kind of scared and stuff because you don't know what they expect. So it was a good experience. It was a good experience. Yeah. Um, how, how did you get through it? What kept you together? Oh, I wanted to come home. Because <laughs> you get down there and it's like, you know, you just got to do what you got to do. Because a lot of guys, if you get injured, you got guys try to commit suicide. You got guys uh, that get injured and have to spend an extra time. Because we had the longest boot camp out of all the branches. So you got uh, guys that get injured and they have to add a year on. So already being out there for 13 weeks. So it's kind of like, let me do what I got to do to survive, play the game, and then. So if you're injured, you stay there? Yep, because they can't sit They don't want to send you home all broken up and stuff in the military. The military take care of it regardless. So they just. Keep you there until you back on your feet. It's one of those days, you know. What um, type of communication did you have with home while you were in Letter writing. Writing? Letter writing, yep. Um, I, I actually called home once, twice when I first got out there, and then for Mother's Day they allowed us to call home, so that was nice. And after that, mm -hmm. man. Um, which war did you serve in? So uh, Iraqi freedom. Uh, and where exactly did you go? Lose exactly in Fallujah, mm -hmm. the Island Bar, uh, Island Bar province. Uh, do you remember arriving in Fallujah? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do. Now, it was, we were sitting on a, we call these, these things seven tons. They're pretty much big trucks that weigh about seven tons. We ride on, on the back of them. We all got our weapons and stuff like that. And we looking at each other like, man, I'm nervous. And they was like, oh my goodness. And when I be riding through the city, they say, watch out for, you know, snipers and this and that. And then all of a sudden, the lights go off in the city. And we're like, oh my God, they signal and they signal. And then the lights come back on. Later on, we find out that they lose electricity <laughs> every so often at a certain time, um, stuff like that. So we were real nervous, sitting there sweating and talking amongst ourselves, you know. By this time, did you know the guys you were with? Yeah, no, we, we trained we trained with each other for three months before we went over there. So you know exactly who you're going to be working with, the attitudes to expect and stuff like that. So. Where did you train? In California. Camp Pendleton. Uh, not Camp Pendleton. Um, what's that name? Actually, I got it written down. We trained. It was in San Diego. It's right next to Camp Pendleton. Hmm. I'm, I'm gonna just say can't uh right there in the San Diego. I'll find out where it was exactly. You can go. Got a twenty nine palms, that's the name of the place we train. Twenty nine? Put twenty nine palms. What was your job? Infantry man. Uh pretty much we did police work. You're we supposed to go there and um Make sure to keep the peace. And if we did get certain intel, we go look for the bad guys and stuff like that. So it's kind of one of those ordeals. Did you have any special assignments? Not any, pretty much. We did night raids and all that stuff, looking for certain people that was on the list, you know, dangerous people to look out for and stuff like that. But pretty much, yeah. It was either night raids or just doing patrolling around the city. That's it. Did you catch any bad guys? Actually, we, we did. Um, and, it, and it's weird because when you go into, they call us the boogeyman over there. To the Iraqi kids, we're known as the boogeyman because we could come into somebody's house without them knowing. And when you actually catch the bad guys, it's a good feeling because you find out, you know, things that they're doing. They out here either killing uh, forces, U.S. forces, or planting bombs, trying to harm people, and this and that. So we did catch a couple guys on the list. What were, was your relationship with the Iraqi children? There was. It was it was good at first. It was real good, you know, giving out toys and stuff. And then we kind of back off because we was going over there providing, you know, giving out clothes and toys and stuff. But uh, it started to change once they started throwing grenades and started signaling to the bad guys, hey, the Americans are here, and, you know, we started getting shot at. So we kind of backed off as far as, like, we still gave out toys, but it was like it went from three times a week to, like, once a week. So everybody got to look over there kind of kind of differently because they all out to get you. A lot of them are, you know. What was the most important change in the case, do you 
Well, that's how that's how the pretty much are. What they do is um they they draw you in, and then they they uh, get you to a point where you're comfortable, and then it's game on. That's pretty much their tactics. The kids. The kids, yeah. They start from when they young. Yeah. Actually, I have been shot at a couple times. <laughs> um, car bombs. We lost a couple guys. Um, I actually saw a couple guys of our guys. Um, the, the last week when we were getting ready to go, we actually had a car bomb that went off. And, you know, you see the, the parts of a suicide bomber in one spot, and then you see one of your friends lying there slowly dying, and it's like, wow. Another one of our guys, he came out of the blast. Stumbled and you know stumbled into somebody and they brought him. He just came home, so he's doing right. good. He came home, man. He got he had burned. He got burned pretty bad, but he they put him in a burn unit, got him all taken care of and stuff like that. So he's good now. That's great. Uh, Were there many casualties in your unit? Out of a th in my unit, we lost about four, but out of a thousand guys, only eleven uh, killed. What does it feel like to lose a guy? It, it does. You, they, they, um, they give you a time out. They let you take the day off and stuff like that. But your mind changed because we went, we went on a couple months without any casualties. You know, so we started feeling invincible. Hey, just when we, then we started getting hit. It's like, wow, you know, this is this is real. This is really war and stuff like that. And it changes your mindset as far as like the reality of uh, death and stuff like that. I actually brought some of the, the uh, couple of our guys um, that died. I got I got about uh, three of them, I think. Three of these guys. Yeah. I sure got two. But these were some of the. One of the guys, it was crazy because I was real close to him. And we used to talk, when we was in California, we used to go to the movies, this guy right here. We used to go to the movies all the time. And, uh, they named the park after him and stuff like that. And I remember the night that I talked to him, uh, it, was, it was different because he used, he used to stay in our room, he left, and he used to come by every so often play video games and stuff like that. But that night he came and wanted to talk in depth and, and for hours we kept talking. I was like, well, you know, we got to we gotta go to sleep because we got a mission in the morning. We got a big mission and stuff like that. So he gave me that kind of look, like, this is goodbye pretty much. So I'm looking at him and, uh, you know, I usually pick him up like he's my little kid or my little brother or whatever. He's like, wow, he's so strong and stuff like that. So I'll pick him up and stuff. And then the next day, you, you know, they go on a mission. And then you see your friend lying there. You see him on the table and stuff. And it's like, wow, you know, this is, this, this is reality and stuff like that. Uh, his name was Pearson, Corporal Pearson, Jordan Pearson. They named a park after him in uh, Milford, Milford, Connecticut. So we just did a um, Memorial Day. We did a the little opening ceremony and stuff like that and dedication. Uh, this guy actually came in. Actually came into the Marine Corps with him. I don't know if you got it. His name is... Uh, okay. His name is Detchen. He actually he um, died on his birthday. His birthday, he passed away, so that was kind of rough. And then this guy right here, Costco, he was an attachment to our unit. Um, he ended up—he's supposed to get married when he come home. When he came home, he ended up dying a week. The car bomb I was telling you about—he was the one that was slowly dying when, when I ran outside. So I see him dying there, but he was supposed to get married when he came home. He was an attachment to our unit. He was from, I, I believe, was Costco from? I was saying, uh, Jersey. He was from Jersey. So, all these guys who got special medals and stuff like that. Yes, sir. Tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. <laughs> um, I know one of them was in the room. We used to have these things. Uh, we used to have these wars. You know, uh, trying to think. It was. In my in my platoon alone, it probably was five black dudes and the rest were whites. So we used to have these things where we get each other, you know, alone. And you're like, yeah, oh, it's on, it's on, it's on. 
and stuff like that. So uh, one of the times they caught me in the room because I'm always I'm known for being the talk. I love to talk junk to guys and stuff like that. So I'm in the room, TV room, we're supposed to play video games, and all of a sudden I see all these guys coming in. I'm like, uh oh. It's like, yeah, we got you by yourself. So they close the door and they lock it. I'm screaming like a little girl. <laughs> and they started beating on me and stuff. And then I faked like I caught an injury in my eyes. I was like, ah, ah, you guys. They're like, oh, stop, stop, stop. He's hurt, he's hurt. It's like, I was like, yeah, I got to go see somebody. As soon as I got out of the door, I looked at him. I said, yeah, y'all dumb as hell. And then I ended up kicking the door and running out and stuff like that. But it was just things like that, you know, camaraderie. Guys really, you know, build. One guy. He was, um, he never really had a bring around black people and to, you know, being around us and stuff. He slowly started to learn different things and stuff like that. He's like, wow, you know, I, I look at you guys totally different now. And, and this kind of brought me closer, you know, to people and stuff like that. Um, I think the camaraderie over there was one of the biggest things. And actually meeting a couple of Iraqi soldiers, uh, some of them guys, were, out of 90% of them, you had about at least I say about not so much 10, but at least 5% of them were actually decent. They actually, you know, they're giving people, the good people, they're really giving. When they give you something, that's like really from like their heart, you can really tell. Because when you give them something, they start crying and it's like, wow, you know, nobody never gave me anything, this and that. So interacting with them and trying their food and stuff, it actually is a good, real good experience and stuff like that. So it's a lot of things that you can actually, you know, you won't forget stuff like things like you see on National Geographic types of deals. So one of those, you know. Where you ever prisoner? Yeah. Um, what was the experience Stay in touch with your family. We allowed. We got um. I usually call three times a week just to let them know everything was good because you know the, the media was showing a lot of uh, uh, well, they were showing the worst things that was going on. You know, blowing a lot of things out of proportion and stuff. Uh, I should not go out of proportion, but highlighting just the negative things. So I made sure I call home and tell them to stop worrying and stop watching the news and stuff like that. So that was that was a good thing. Yeah, the media was just portraying there's a lot of the bad stuff and stuff, you know. Some of the things that was going on were good, actually, you know, interactions and things like that. So. How was the food like? It was actually very, very good. Fresh, but it was good. They eat a lot of lamb. That's really their thing. Lamb is, is yeah, it's fresh. You see, uh, I never really, well, I should say, I didn't see it once, but they actually slaughter right there on the streets. And you can tell the food is fresh, they cut it up right there in front of you, and then they, you know, the, the lamb will be over there eating and grazing. And next you know, they lying in, they, they yeah. I mean, something. <laughs> it's, it's definitely to see your food get killed. It's like, wow, you know what? Did you have plenty of supplies? Oh, yeah. We got this world, we get a lot of support from Americans and people all around the world. I mean, people send us all kinds of care packages, people we didn't know. I mean, from socks to foods to even car air freshening and stuff like that. We got it all, so we were very supplied. Uh, did you have uh, pen pals with anybody here that you didn't know that were you adopted as a Pretty much, no. Uh, we got we got a lot of letters from kids. So I get well, you could say I guess we got adopted from from uh, elementary schools because they we got a lot of letters from the kids from New York. Can't remember out of where, but from New York. It is. That's like one of the best things you can receive over there. Those are care packages it's like Christmas. <laughs> you know. Did you feel any pressure or stress? Well, every day you wake up is kind of like one of those deals where, wow, you know, I need to live or die today. It's kind of those. So you always you don't realize it until you come home. But every day, you're living under the pressure of trying to survive and every day. And people say that you'll never realize how much pressure or stress you was under until you reach American soil. Because when you take that sigh of relief, it's like, you know, all the way to the world. So every day you wake up, I mean, because we saw it all. We saw it all. So I even had to do my, I did my first car chase in Iraq. So. <laughs> well, we, um, 
we got this thing what we call it's called fob security uh, where you where you say like central's the base you got people doing security making sure that nobody's trying to to shoot or whatever at us or try to and one of the posts that we had uh, one of the guys got sniped at he was fixing putting up cami net and stuff and while he was on top of the roof he got shot at he called it in and we were the qrf the quick reaction force which means you go out and make sure things is good and stuff like that so we got called up and we went out and when we thought uh, the sniper fire came from uh, was from the, usually a lot of things come from the mosque because you're not allowed to go into the mosque out of respect for the religion. So we seen the car come from behind it, and my uh, come, my platoon commander uh, told us to go. He said, "He said, Ismail, I want you to follow this car." So I'm like, "I got that, sir. Good to go." Or I'm like, "Huh, something." So I, the car comes up. He starts taking off because he sees it behind him. So I floor it, and the Humvees don't go that fast because they weigh so much. And he's in a BMW. And he's going, going, going. And the mistake he made was when he turned around and did a U-turn because he had me. He had me at least a good, probably about 200 meters, probably about 200. But when he turned the corner, I was able to, to pop the medium with the Humvee because the tires are so strong. So I hop over the Humvee uh, with the Humvee, cut across, and we ended up catching him. But they didn't have anything on him and stuff like that. They're like, Mr. Mr., we were scared. We didn't know. We didn't know. We are like, all right, yeah, sure you did and stuff like that. But he had to let them go in their merry way. So that was... Pretty interesting, you know. Was there anything that you did special for good luck? Over there, you pray. You did. Uh, How did people entertain themselves? <laughs> um, we actually had TV, so we had cable. It was good watching the um. Uh, the Middle Eastern music videos was pretty interesting to see that stuff like that. The DVDs, we got tons of DVDs. I mean, you name it, we had it. So movies, movies, and uh, cable, pretty much magazines too. A lot of magazines. So it was one of those ordeals. Did you have the internet? Yeah, I mean, we had restrictions to certain sites you can get on and stuff like that. You did have. Whenever we did, somebody, you know, sometimes we get guys that got in trouble or did something stupid, like not cleaning up and stuff, so that got shut down a lot of times. But when we did have it, there was, uh, the line was ridiculous to, to use. Yeah, it was, but we did have some access to that. Were there any entertainers that came to do shows? Um... The Philadelphia Eagles cheerleaders came. Cheerleaders came, and we was on a mission, so we didn't get. A, I didn't get a chance, but uh, they they came uh, to support the troops, and they started complaining like, "Oh, you guys, you guys are smelly and stuff like that." It was like, I mean, we we, we could only shower three times a week and stuff like that, but uh, they came and entertained for a little bit. Man. Did you get leave time? No, we get um we don't get we do when we was training in California we get what is it we get a week um, halfway part and then you get four days before you go overseas and then you get your leave time when you come back into the states that's the difference between the Marines and the Army they get their leave they can come home and stuff we just stayed and did a whole tour. Uh, can you describe a typical day in training? Uh, usually you get up at um. Actually, I, I read it. I think I got an entry about it. <laughs> but usually, you get up at like five in the morning. You do your exercise, and our platoon commander was a PT stud. I mean, I run and all that stuff, but this guy takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, I got one. This was on January 11th, uh, 06. Today was a physical. Uh, a tough day. First, we had a, a mild hump with full pack. Those packs are usually anywhere between 50 and plus pounds on your back. Man. Uh, afterwards, we had a three plus mile boots and use. So that means you wear your utilities, your pants, with your boots. And you had to run. We had to run in those for three miles. Man. Um, had to run in the cement and the sand. During the run, we stop and do push ups, mountain climbers, all kinds of. Stuff is called like a circus run. So you get down, you start, you do a quarter of a mile, you do your push-ups, then you gotta run and do 
crunches and all that stuff. Uh, flooded kids. Uh, later that day, we did patrols. We figure in California, 29 pounds, they get you prepared for the desert, so that's pretty much like uh, we got up to 80 plus degrees, just hot, straight heat. Um, uh, the hard part was we constantly was running uh, on the sand and, and the berms. Uh, yeah, we got I got we got yelled at. We had one of our, our um, squad leaders. He was an older guy. He he been to Somalia and stuff, but he was very hard on us, very hard. Like we we work hard during the weekend. You get the weekends off, but with him because we had guys that couldn't run and stuff like that. The whole squad, which consists of 13 guys, would be in trouble. So we could never, he'd be like, yeah, your weekend secure, you can't leave base, you gotta sit here and, and, and work out and stuff like that. So that happened to us for like, out of the three months, I wanna say about almost the whole two months, we had got in trouble where we couldn't go anywhere. And that's because a few guys couldn't Yeah, a few guys couldn't run, uh, we didn't do something right. And stuff. Whole... Yeah, everybody, we suffered as a. <laughs> Uh, no, the first day we got off the bus, we had to clean up. Usually it takes about two weeks, and then usually, actually I don't want to say a week, and then you slowly start to fall back in the routine, because it reminds you of boot camp all over again, so. Usually you fall into the routine in about a week, a week and a half, so. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? <laughs> uh... I mean, with us, every day we made, we made humor out of everything. I mean, for the movies we watched, we used to watch like kid movies, like we saw all the Harry Potters over there, <laughs> uh, Xanthora, kid movies. Um, yeah, every day, every day we made, we had to laugh, so, you know, so. Some of the pranks that you or others would pull. <laughs> you don't get caught alone, no matter who you are. Yeah, because uh, a lot of times you get caught, they usually duct tape you up to leave you out there in the open. They even leave you with your shorts on or <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. How do you get out of that? <laughs> Eventually, somebody walking to you and they look around, hey, we're such and such. He duct tape so somewhere else. <laughs> One of those are those. So, did you make close friends? Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, one of the guys I just emailed today, he's from Texas. He was what we call a corpsman, which is like a, what you would say, a field nurse. If anything happened, he's the one that's there to fix you up and stuff like that. He was pretty much my, my, my right hand man because we'll go outside every night. Uh, and talk, just talk about life and just everything in general. And I always give him credit for what, you know, I thought our job was hard, but imagine if you got a guy shot, you got a guy shot, and he's there working on you, uh, working on that person while he's getting shot at. So I give him, my hat goes off to him. His name is Doc Allen, Donald Allen, yeah, so. Donald Allen, but we call him Doc. That's what we call him, Doc, yeah. You said that you got shot at. Did you ever get hit? No, I was lucky. I was blessed not to get hit. Um, but I, uh, the first time we went out, I remember the guy that got shot in front of me. He got shot in the head, actually. His name is Link. Uh, he survived. And that was like, wow. When I actually saw him get shot, and my man Doc Allen ran out to go work on him, make sure he was, you know, it was, everything was all right. And I was driving to Humvee, and he was probably no less than 20 feet in front of me. And I'm looking this way, and then all of a sudden we heard a pop. And then you see him get hit, as he get hit though, he's pointing in the direction of where he got hit. So, you know, we rush him off, get him to the hospital and stuff like that. He's good to go. They get him about three days off. They could, he, he, he opted to stay. He could have got sent home, but he opted to stay. But uh, we ended up going around, securing him, looking everywhere. We called in for support and everything. Over there, we didn't catch, we caught one sniper uh, that was doing, those guys that, well, two of the guys that got shot we believe was from the sniper that we ended up catching within the um, the last couple of days being there. But uh, man, I never got shot. When I got shot at, it's weird because you're like, what was that sound? 
is what I'll ask. I'm standing in the open, and my friend running, get, get down, we're getting shot up. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, so it's, it's, it's a different experience as a whole, you know. Who are the snipers? They could be anywhere. Um, a lot of times the snipers were guys just, just they're like any other person out in the populace. You can't tell them. Uh, these are not like when they first went to Iraq, you know who you're fighting. Anybody in this uniform, you go and get. These guys were, they could, uh, we figured they were either from Iraq itself or Iran or Saudi Arabia. It was coming from all around. So you don't, you don't know who the enemy was because they were dressed just like everyone else. So that was the most difficult part about it. Mm -hmm. How did that help you cope with things right now? Pretty much it was like therapeutic because, you know, um, guys don't, you know, guys are going to be guys. So it's like you don't want to tell your boy how you, you, you know what I'm saying, some sensitive things that's going on. Like, wow, you know, um, this and this really bothered me. I was like to the point of, uh, it's pretty much you just writing your, your, your most inner thoughts, you know, that you usually share with yourself on paper, kind of like, a reflection of what you know later on in the years you can look back and be like wow you know I remember this 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 so that was this was pretty much my dad gave it to me I'm like what, what are you giving me a diary for I'm a grown man but uh, a lot of guys are like wow you know I wish I would have had one over there if they did have one it was very therapeutic to have and stuff like that so what other personal things did you take with you? Hmm, I took that a bible um, I think that was about it the lady gave us, she gave us some prayer cloths. She gave us those before we left. So I kept that in my pocket at all times. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much it. And then later I ended up getting pictures from home. So I used to look at those, you know, once a week to be like, yeah, I'm coming home to y'all, you know. So that was one of those things. How often did you get mail? Well, <laughs> My family probably sent me like two pieces of letters, so I felt deprived. So I told my first son, he's like, oh, your family, because I was calling him, so I was like, you know, you don't really need to send me anything anyways. He's like, well, you know, he said, you know, you're going to be one of my bastard kids. I'm going to go ahead and put you on the list. And now I started getting, I got letters, I mean, every week, probably like two to three times a week, I was getting packages upon packages, because he put me on an adoptive marine um, thing, so. First time Granger, that was the guy. First time he's still with us today, and that's the man. Um, he pretty much, I, if I was to serve again, that'd be the only guy that I actually go to because the man had a heart attack. He went to Germany, had a chance to go home, decided to come back to finish out the tour of duty with us and stuff. And he done already been to Iraq, maybe two to three times. He's been in over 20 years. But, uh, I mean, every day he'd call us, talk to us, joke around. You know, my rank compared to his rank is kind of like, you know, a regular worker and your your, your vice president of, a, of the company kind of like that. So for him to come down and talk and see how guys was, making sure everything was all right, you know, things and that. He's a good guy. What's his name? First Sergeant Granger. 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 Yeah, <laughs> I got these two guys, uh, Petty and Bellinger. Both are from Massachusetts, and they both uh, they call themselves the Rednecks of the Hillbillies because they they're from the countries, the the sticks. And these two guys, whenever they see me, it's just like uh, they kind of. Uh, get in touch with their urban side they come see me and stuff like that but uh, those guys I mean we had real talks you know talk about life and stuff like that but jokesters some of the guys when we had the, the blacks and whites some of the guys that get me by myself and then commence <laughs> but in reality there were some real real good guys um, I see them all the time whenever I go to my unit um, those guys I got a friend named Washington I'm actually supposed to be in his wedding in um, August uh, he's Craig Washington, and another guy, um, uh, what's my boy name, man? It's a lot of them. You end up being cool. I got a friend named Lewis. He got shot 
He got shot in the chest. The, the bulletproof vest kept him alive. Um, I talk to him every time I see him. You know, he's always smart. He's like, man, I'm home. <laughs> you know, um, he's doing good. Uh, yeah, all good guys. Yeah, um, it's like you walking, all of a sudden you just see like, like dust, just tons of dust, and it's slowly coming at you like a wall. It looks like it's a mile high, and it's just starting to, you see the city um, slowly start to disappear, and it's coming in your direction, you're like, wow, are you serious? This is really coming towards me, so you're throwing your little mask or whatever. And you, we always got goggles on, always got goggles, and it's just... Once it comes to you, it's almost like a snowstorm. You can't see, depending on how thick it is, sometimes you can't see past you. The one, I think I got one on my camera, this was kind of light. So it's coming towards you, you know, everything. You are nauseous, you just, you get sand in places you never thought you'd get sand in. <laughs> so it's definitely weird. Did you ever get caught in one where you couldn't find your way? No, I, I was actually, the one that, uh, the one that I saw, I was good to go because I was going to, to my post to do the little fob security thing I talked about. Um, and you could see, you know, pretty decently in front of you. Pretty decent. Well, you could see even five to ten feet in front of you, so it wasn't that bad. Right. What did you sleep in? We actually had mattresses. Um, they weren't the cleanest mattresses, but you had mattresses that you slept on. We use our, you know, we have we lay our sleeping bags and stuff like that. But when we went on missions, We'll sleep in anything. I mean, blowing out buildings. I mean, I was sleeping on concrete at times, a lot of times on the floor. When we went out to do a couple of days missions, I'll be setting up security and stuff like that. we sleeping on just rocks, rubbles and stuff. So like, you name it, we slept there. <laughs> Can you describe a typical day in Iraq? In Iraq? Um, it was weird because you can go a whole day with nothing going on. You could be sleeping and just relaxing. Um, when we did our fob security, that went on for three days. Uh, you do six hour shifts where you sit and looking out of a window for six hours, a uh, bulletproof glass, I should say. Um, and if you QRF, uh, the quick reaction force, sometimes if there's nothing going on, you can just be hanging out all day, just looking, you know, you gotta go and do, you know, phone watch or, uh, yeah, phone watch or radio watch. So you sit there with your little magazine and you read whatever for six hours or an hour and stuff like that. And then there's days when, you know, we started getting, you know, guys getting hit with um, roadside bombs and stuff. And you just running, you know, you could be sit like we could be sitting here talking next, you know, I'm running out the door. And within five minutes, you got to get dressed, get your clothes on and out the, out in the Humvees and stuff, getting ready to roll. And you ride around the city just looking, looking for people and stuff like that. So it had high lows. Uh, if we could have night missions, like we could be out all day, have done a, a seven hour patrol where you out there in the sun, which got up, the hottest it got was 160 degrees. 150. 150. 50, but with your gear on, it made it 160. Uh, you be out there all day doing that, and then all of a sudden, you come, you come back, you rest for like an hour or two. All right, we got a night mission, we gotta go get such and such at night. Then you run out. Well, we we got this thing called blackout. You ride around with your MVGs. You go to where your the um, place that they got scoped out on the map. You can be setting up there. We'll set up a perimeter. Like whoever the guys to go in and sneak in. You can either jump in the roof or use the um, ladder stuff like that. Sneak in, grab who you gotta grab. So it's it was never a regular day type deal. Uh, I mean, first of all, we counted down the days. Hey, day, you just started doing slashes. But when you actually, when we was done that last week, you know, it was like after we, the, the, that last week getting ready to come home, we lost the guy. The week kind of went kind of sour. Like, wow, man, we was this close. But uh, once you're done with all the memorials and stuff like that, then um, you get into a secured, secured area where they get ready to come home and stuff. It's a secured area in Iraq where it's in Fallujah still, but you pretty much, you're done. You turn over the city to the next group of guys 
and you just pretty much just smiling the whole time. And then uh, I remember one time, we was in our little tents that we stayed in, and we going to get something to eat, because, you know, ice cream was like, mm. Same way she talked about ice cream, oh my goodness, that was like, <laughs> like candy. So we had to get some ice cream, we run to go get ice cream and stuff. Then all of a sudden, um, um, we get this thing over the intercom, um, incoming, 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 because the bad guy was trying to shoot around. I was like, we about to go home, they still trying to get us. I'm like, wow, goodness gracious, but, you know, we laughed it off, and then we made it to Kuwait, and it was nothing but teeth. The whole time, we just kept smiling the whole time, like, wow, this is it, we're on our way home. We made it, you know, so it's just like one of the best feelings in the world. But, all right. How long were you in Iraq? I was there for six and a half months. And how did you work with the Iraqi soldiers and the Iraqi police? Uh, with them, we would take them out. Like if we doing, uh, we were showing them how to do patrols. Um, the Iraqi soldiers, um, constantly got to yell at them because. We trying to show them the right way to do things, and they're lazy, and they're walking around with their heads down and stuff like that. And you're like, look, if you want to survive, if you want to do this, you know, this is how you do it. The Iraqi police, we had to work with. A lot of times, we'll go over there to their police station and work out of their police station. Um, but we didn't trust the Iraqi police too much because they were also aiding the bad guys. One time, we was all out. We got comfortable. We was, we was on our base. Um, bringing them water, supplies, and stuff like that. And we all left our, our vests and stuff off. And all of a sudden, we started getting uh, what we call as mortars, which is uh, mortars are pretty much like bombs. Well, they are bombs, our missiles, I want to say, that the enemy was sh shooting in towards us. But the only reason why we started getting mortar rounds was because we figured the police had called and saying, hey, we got a bunch of Marines out here. Our whole unit was outside, just grabbing the water, laughing, enjoying ourselves. And we never get rounds at this type of hour, you know, and all of a sudden we started getting around, so you see a bunch of guys running, like, oh, this is not, stuff like that, so we dealt with the Iraqi police, you know, trained them and stuff, but we wasn't too fond of it. Why were they aiding the other side? Well, a lot of times the, the, the other side was giving them more money than what they were making, um, so, you know, you figure they, they kill an American, they looking at five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, which doesn't sound much to us, but to them. You figure an income of four hundred dollars a month, you know, so five, six thousand dollars, they're living pretty wealthy. And then on top of that, a lot of them was getting a lot of grief. You know, their families were being killed. If they were real good and really working with us, uh, you have, uh, we had a body. We had somebody call in that there was a body of an uh, Iraqi police who was actually a good, good police. They had beheaded him and threw his body out in the middle of the, um, the middle of the city. So it was kind of. One of those there. Uh, yeah. When it's the end of your time in Iraq, how do you introduce the next group of guys coming in? Well, the next group of guys, we give them a, we got a two week system. Um, the first week, they riding with us, are doing patrols with us. We showing them what to do, um, showing them how to do such and things, uh, certain things, where to go, where not, where to be careful when you go. You know, these are the real, real bad spots. And then the second week, we riding behind them, we shadowing them, seeing how they do things, seeing if they took on what we told them to do. And if they did something differently, you know, we tell them, you might want to think about this and that, this and that. So it's pretty much like a, uh, a buddy aid, buddy system type thing. Uh, left seat, right seat is what we call it. Uh, left seat, right seat. Uh, and then it's time for you to go home. Yeah. What is it like coming back to America? What is the process? Well, when we got home, we stayed. You stay in, the, um, you stay in a, the so-called secure area of um, in Iraq, still in Fallujah. Um, you go there, then you get helicoptered out to um, the Air Force Base, which is is very secure. I mean, we got a chance. We stayed there for a week. Actually, four days until our flight was ready to get flown out into Kuwait. But uh, when we, during our time, the Air Force Base, Iraq water is beautiful. It's like a royal. It's, it's like a greenish, bluish type color. Very, very beautiful. You know, we got a chance to just ride around, um, 
the, the base, see what's going on, and stuff like that. We had air conditioned places and stuff. And then when you get flown out, you go to Kuwait. We stayed in Kuwait for like a week, and the, the threat level in Kuwait is pretty much not any at all. So we got there, we just enjoyed ourselves, just walked around, played volleyball with the Air Force, because the Air Force, they got the good life. Uh, yeah, volleyball was a big thing, played a little basketball. And then just from there you go, from Kuwait, we went to Germany. From Germany, we flew over Ireland, but the first stop in America was Maine. 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 And once we saw America, that, I mean, we get off the flight, you got vets, uh, people who support vets and all that, just standing there clapping as you're coming off. And I was like, yeah, your heart is just, just like pounding because you're like, I can't believe it. You see people with smiling faces. You see actual Americans. And then uh, the colors, colors what throws you off because you see sand, you see, you know, grayish brown the whole time over there. So you're seeing colors. And the first thing we saw was the trees. Oh, that was so beautiful. It was fall time too. I mean, you see the trees and stuff like that. Now you got they got cell phones, food, all kinds of stuff for you. Call home, mom. I'm in Maine. I'm in America. Your mom, is, your, your family just clapping. He's like, you know, tearful. Some people crying. Some people just like, wow. And then from there, you go to California, um, San Diego. Uh, they keep you there for for a couple weeks. We stood there. We stood about two to three weeks. We was over there. And you go through all kinds of evaluations, mental, um, mentally, make sure you're all right. And then you got uh, a lot of downtime. You just they let you be. They don't mess with you too much. And then they just welcome you back into the civilized world. You know, desensitize. Well, not desensitize. Demobilize you, telling you, you know you can't do this. You can't do that. Just you back home now. Yeah, 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 the rules, you can't just jump out yelling at people no more and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, they tell you certain signs. They tell you things, because with us, the loud noise used to get us at first, because we got bombed every, just about every week, or every other week. And then it got to the point when we got close to the home, the enemy knows when you, when you start bringing in new people. So the closer you get to go home, the more they mentally try to mess with you. So we started getting bombed. One time we got bombed every day. It's like, wow. You know, you got guy, because the bathrooms we had were porter johns for six and a half months. <laughs> so you got guys out there running with it, you know, uh, running out, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, in California, you pretty much left alone, you know. They're just happy that you're home and the love and stuff like that that we got. So. Does that help? In the demobilization process? It does. Um, that's one of the better things that they start, you know, instead of coming out of a combatant zone and just get dropped back into, back to home, it doesn't work. And this system that they've been doing, they've been having better, um, uh, better outcomes of troops coming home and stuff like that because you know, they want to evaluate you, make sure, you know, you, you don't go home yelling at your family, you know, stuff like that. And I mean, by the time they're done with you, they ask, I mean, it's this body, this, this, this. Mentally, they check up on you. Physically, they make sure your health is in good condition before they send you. You know, they had a couple guys that were injured. Um, they make sure before they even took them. We still got guys on active duty because they're making sure before they send them home that they, they're in top knob shape, stuff like that. So, out of a thousand guys, we only had two guys that went crazy. And then they, they got sent to Maryland. And then now they're good to go. They take care of you. They take care of you, yeah. How long have you been back? I have been home since. We got back in October. I got home in November. So. Of 2006? 2006. I think it's like 10 months. 10 months? Yeah. What did you do as soon as you got back to Hartford? <laughs> so I got back to Hartford, I, I was hugging everybody. I mean, I even hugged the tree just because. <laughs> I mean, I was just so done with violence and stuff like that. You know, I was just so, from a smile, smile than anything. Even my dog, he came jumping up and I was like, I miss you, little butt. <laughs> but uh, when I first came home, 
we had the when we got into Hartford, we had the we got into Connecticut, we got um, escorted in by guys on bikes, the state police, the whole yards. I mean, we actually felt like little stars. Then we get off, we had to get in, um, get in ranks, and then we marched into the state arm armory, downtown Hartford, and Governor Rell, she actually came, she has my support. She actually came, shook each and every one of our hands as we marched in, and then they pulled the curtains, and we standing in formation, and we had to do a little turn, you know, to face the audience and stuff like that. And then you hear all your family screaming, the flags going, everything. And it's like, wow, you know, this is all for us. And after that, your family come running towards you. And just like, wow, you know. I think I called everybody that I could. Everybody that mom I called. And then when I came home, my boys were already preparing to go to Iraq. So they're over there now. Yeah. They will be home August and September, October time. Right. What have you been doing since? Since working, school, enjoying life. Where do you work? <laughs> I work in Manchester. I actually work with people with disabilities. So I do that. Got my pay that helps me with my patients and stuff. <laughs> right. Central, I am going to school for English, but I'm looking hopefully to get my career in parole probation. I have an internship coming up with them in the fall, so i dealing with that. Is your education supported by the GI Bill? Yes, school is free. When I, when you, when I first um, joined the Marine Corps, all we got was about 292 a month for school. Now you get your, your, your tuition's paid for. You get almost you, well, you get almost about seven hundred dollars a month for school uh, for books and stuff alone. So the yeah, it does. It does. Is that just the Marine Corps thing? Yeah, the Marine Corps. Uh, well, the all the other branches pay for your tuition and all that. They pay for tuition automatically. The, the uh, National Guard and the Air National, the Marine Corps considered the cheap guys, you know, because uh, they don't want to spend all kinds of money, because we don't get as much funding as the rest of the branches. So that's why we get just <laughs> exactly. Did you join a veterans organization? Not yet. Exactly. Yeah, I need to. Did your military experience influence the way you think about war or about the military in general? Um, it did actually. Um, going overseas and stuff like that, you see what's going on. Now that I, I, I got my perspective on what the war was like, I'm not too, too much of a big fan of it. Um, and things are going on, stuff like that. The military, I'm all, you know, I'm always be supportive of it. But I tell people that want to join, you know, if you're going to do it, do it because you're not doing anything with yourself. You know, if you're not going to school or you're not working, the military is an extra place because you can see countries. I mean, they got good jobs, um, stuff like that. You can be anywhere from an accountant to doing fiberglass and working on helicopters and come out of the military, getting into these jobs on the civilian side anywhere making I don't know, fifty plus stuff like that. Training for a civilian job when you come out? Yeah, well the job exactly it does, depending on what you choose. Yeah. I just didn't do the do I did uh, the only job I could do with my job is like police type work. Yeah. Did you attend any reunions yet or are any plans? We had, um, when we came home, we had the Marine Corps ball, so we seen everybody. Um, saw my squad leader, the one that got shot. Saw him, he's in, he's in good health. He's doing better. Uh, the ball, yeah, and so, um, he got a couple guys that came up from Jersey. I got a friend named Kasanico. He was uh, actually in my squad. He, he should be getting married. Tom, Tom Kasanico, he came up, him and his fiance, he should, I think he's married now. But to see those guys come from New Jersey and all of us reuniting, you know, because our platoon commander had gotten shot as long as my squad leader. 
the guy that yelled at us in training that kept us on punishment like his, uh, he was doing my job because I had got transferred to do something else. But he himself and the platoon commander took point. So to see them, you know, especially to survive the type of shot, because he got shot in the neck and it came out through his face and the other guy got shot. The platoon commander got shot in the chest and it collapsed one of his lungs. But uh, to see them fully recover and stuff like that, it's just a big reunion. We hugged everybody. You know, guys were getting out. Some of them guys, were there. that was the last, the last time being in the Marine Corps and stuff. So it was just drinks and smiles, you know. You are still in the reserves. Still in the reserves. How long will you stay? I will be out in February of 09. But I tell people I am done in December of 08 because that's when I signed the contract. So, but really, the uh, February 09, I'm out. So, you won't be going back to Iraq? No. Most likely. Nah, nah we, yeah, we should be done. By the time my unit may go again, I'll be out. So, no plans. What is it like coming back from Iraq and still being in the reserves training? Well, you, you look at training like, you know, this. It's weird because you, you, the training that we do, you know, we go out, we do the navigation and all that stuff, but we like, we know all this stuff now. It's like what we do is train the new guys that just come in because I got a group of guys that I got to train and stuff like that. So with them, we try to keep it serious with them and show them, you know, you guys may be going or will be going next year because if another unit needs you guys, y'all got to go. But as far as for ourselves, we look at training just like, you know, just a weekend thing. Like, hey, are you serious? They just trying to keep us to do something. But when we do got the new guys and it's something serious, we on them. You know, we want you to do the best you can do to survive and stuff like that. You must offer a good perspective because you know what it is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How often do you go training? One week in a month. Uh-huh. And next, well, we usually do one week in a month, two weeks out of the year for the summertime, uh, annual training. But because we just got back, I don't have to go. So, like, yeah. hell yeah, because they going to... Some are going to Australia, some are going to, to California, and some are going to Virginia. So the new guys are going to Australia, so, like, yeah. And I've been in other places, so I'm good. Uh, can you describe a typical weekend at training in the Yeah, um, like the last week we had, we got a, a, the company commander that served with us over in Iraq. He's new to, the, to, the, to our unit. And he made us do about 20 miles of exercise within three days. We did, uh, we had our physical fitness test, three mile run, pillows, crunches. Um, on top of that, we had to hike with our packs on to where we were going to um, be at. We got about a couple hours of sleep, then we had to be up quite early in the morning. Um, and we, we hump. Our hike is what we uh, for like hours from 12 hours just hiking and then within that in that mix of, of navigating finding our way because they put you in the middle of the woods and you got to find your way to where you got to go on top of that we had to do a, a confidence course which is like almost a, 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 a half a mile to a mile of just rope climbing you know pulling up on bars we got this thing called the highway to heaven the stairway to heaven I'm sorry so it's taller than a light pole. You gotta climb that. It's just very physical. Then we had to. We went to sleep. Your, your toes are throbbing. You're like, oh my god. Yeah, wake up. And we had to hike again to where we were catching the buses to. And then we had to do a leadership course where it was more climbing and all that stuff. So that was that was physical, physical weekend. Okay. Now, old commander, we usually go play in the woods for a little bit, and then we go home on Sunday. <laughs> Oh, I go. To, I go to the gym just about every day. Usually either either five or four times out of the week, and I run on my own. I play basketball, one or two, biking. You know, anything physical. I like to do and stuff like that. So that's why I try to stay in shape. How did your service and experiences in the war affect your life? It made me appreciate things more. I came home. Um, with a new farm respect for our freedom, 
and really seeing how you know the American way of living is the best way. You know, you don't you take it for granted because you you never really uh, if you haven't been anywhere like myself prior to, and you just see the way. Just, I mean, somebody can yell at you, you know, blow their horn and stuff like that, but you don't gotta worry about them trying to set up to to try to get you later on. It's just hey, get out the way, stuff like that. I just being able to just walk freely with no worries and stuff like that. I appreciate life so much more, you know. And I'm always smiling. That's one of the things I'm always, because it's just like, you know, I'm glad to be back. So it made me very appreciative. What is the one thing that you appreciate the most being back in America after coming home? Uh, <laughs> the most is being with my family. Being with my family. The second most is being around ladies, because I've been around <laughs> guys for a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> so number two is being around ladies, you know. <laughs> is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered yet? Um, out of this world, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised at the amount of support that we get from um, the citizens. Seriously, I mean, they keep the amount of respect that you get and just the support uh, it really does a lot. Because, you know, you get letters from people you never met. People, you know, offering you all kinds of things and stuff like that. So, I mean, the support that we get, I'm glad. I, I hope they continue to do what they do. The American people are more supportive. Yeah, you got your people that, that are against the war and stuff like that, but that's always going to be. But the support that we get is overwhelming and it's very good experience. Other than that, that's it. Thank you for your time. Right, not a problem. <laughs>